Welcome back to Another World Audiobooks. Thank you guys for tuning in, and hello to our new listeners. I have been noticing a bit of a spike in recent listen analytics and all that sort of technical stuff. <laughs> but yeah, if you're just tuning in, if this is one of your first episodes, thank you for coming on board with the Another World Audiobooks family. So glad to have you here. And uh, yeah, as always, just got to say a huge thank you to our patrons. Thank you to Sharon, to Ariella, and Brianna. Thank you guys for uh, making this podcast possible. If you want to join in with the fun, head on over to anotherworldaudiobooks.com and you can go ahead and become a sponsor of the podcast, which is pretty cool. And uh, if you don't want to do that, that's totally fine. I'll keep making you free audiobooks. It's just a great way to help make sure that the podcast keeps going. Uh, it's a, a labor of love and want to keep doing this, but I need your help. So spreading the word is the best way to do that. Just tell other people about the podcast. And now, without further ado, let's get into the next chapter of The Return. Sherlock Holmes. Chapter 3. The Adventure of the Dancing Men Holmes had been seated for some hours in silence, with his long, thin back curved over a chemical vessel, in which he was brewing a particularly malodorous product. His head was sunk upon his breast, and he looked, from my point of view, like a strange, lank bird, with dull grey plumage and a black topknot. So, Watson, said he suddenly, you do not propose to invest in South African securities. I gave a start of astonishment. Accustomed as I was to Holmes's curious faculties, this sudden intrusion into my most intimate thoughts was utterly inexplicable. How on earth do you know that? I asked. He wheeled round upon his stool, with a steaming test tube in his hand, and a gleam of amusement in his deep-set eyes. Now, Watson, confess yourself utterly taken aback, said he. I am. I ought to make you sign a paper to that effect. Why? Because in five minutes you will say that it is all so absurdly simple. I am sure that I shall say nothing of the kind. You see, my dear Watson, he propped his test tube in the rack and began to lecture with the air of a professor addressing his class. It is not really difficult to construct a series of inferences, each dependent upon its predecessor, and each simple in itself. If, after doing so, one simply knocks out all the central inferences, and presents one's audience with the starting point and the conclusion, one may produce a startling, though possibly a meretricious, effect. Now, it was not really difficult, by an inspection of the groove between your left forefinger and thumb, to feel sure that you did not propose to invest your small capital in the gold fields. I see no connection. Very likely not, but I can quickly show you a close connection. Here are the missing links of the very simple chain. 1. You had chalk between your left finger and thumb when you returned from the club last night. 2. You put the chalk there when you played billiards to steady the cue. 3. You never play billiards except with Thurston. 4. You told me four weeks ago that Thurston had an option on some South African property, which would expire in a month, and which he desired you to share with him. 5. Your checkbook is locked in my drawer, and you have not asked for the key. 6. You do not propose to invest your money in this manner. How absurdly simple, I cried. Quite so, said he, a little nettled. Every problem becomes very childish when once it is explained to you. Here is an unexplained one. See what you can make of that, friend Watson. He tossed a sheet of paper upon the table, and turned once more to his chemical analysis. I looked with amazement at the absurd hieroglyphics upon the paper. Why, Holmes, it is a child's drawing, I cried. Oh, that's your idea. What else could it be? That is what Mr. Hilton Cubitt of Ridingthorpe Manor, Norfolk, is very anxious to know. This little conundrum came by the first post, and he was to follow by the next train. There's a ring at the bell, Watson. I should not be very much surprised if this were he. A heavy step was heard upon the stairs, and an instant later there entered a tall, ruddy, clean-shaven gentleman, whose clear eyes and florid cheeks told of a life led far from the fogs of Baker Street. He seemed to bring a whiff of his strong, fresh, bracing East Coast air with him as he entered. Having shaken hands with each of us, he was about to sit down, when his eyes rested upon the paper with the curious markings, which I had just examined and left upon the table. "'Well, Mr. Holmes, what do you make of these?' he cried. "'They told me that you were fond of queer mysteries, and I don't think you can find a queerer one than that. 
I sent the paper on ahead so that you might have time to study it before I came. It is certainly rather a curious production, said Holmes. At first sight, it would appear to be some childish prank. It consists of a number of absurd little figures dancing across the paper upon which they are drawn. Why should you attribute any importance to so grotesque an object? I never should, Mr. Holmes, but my wife does. It is frightening her to death. She says nothing, but I can see terror in her eyes. That's why I want to sift the matter to the bottom. Holmes held up the paper so that the sunlight shone full upon it. It was a page torn from a notebook. The markings were done in pencil and ran in this way. A.M. Dash here. Dash Abe. Dash Slaney. Holmes examined it for some time, and then, folding it carefully up, he placed it in his pocketbook. This promises to be a most interesting and unusual case, said he. You gave me a few particulars in your letter, Mr. Hilton Cubitt, but I should be very much obliged if you would kindly go over it all again for the benefit of my friend, Dr. Watson. I'm not much of a storyteller, said our visitor, nervously clasping and unclasping his great strong hands. You'll just ask me anything that I don't make clear. I'll begin at the time of my marriage last year, but I want to say, first of all, that, though I'm not a rich man, my people have been at Riding Thorpe for a matter of five centuries, and there is no better known family in the county of Norfolk. Last year, I came up to London for the Jubilee, and I stopped at a boarding house in Russell Square, because Parker, the vicar of our parish, was staying in it. There was an American young lady there. Patrick was the name. Elsie Patrick. In some way, we became friends, until before my month was up, I was as much in love as a man could be. We were quietly married at a registry office, and we returned to Norfolk, a wedded couple. You'll think it very mad, Mr. Holmes, that a man of a good old family should marry a wife in this fashion, knowing nothing of her past or of her people, but if you saw her and knew her, it would help you to understand. She was very straight about it, was Elsie. I can't say that she did not give me every chance of getting out of it if I wished to do so. I have had some very disagreeable associations in my life, said she. I wish to forget all about them. I would rather never allude to the past, for it is very painful to me. If you take me, Hilton, you will take a woman who has nothing that she need be personally ashamed of, but you will have to be content with my word for it, and to allow me to be silent as to all that passed up to the time when I became yours. If these conditions are too hard, then go back to Norfolk and leave me to the lonely life in which you found me. It was only the day before our wedding that she said those very words to me. I told her that I was content to take her on her own terms, and I have been as good as my word. Well, we have been married now for a year, and very happy we have been. But about a month ago, at the end of June, I saw for the first time signs of trouble. One day, my wife received a letter from America. I saw the American stamp. She turned deadly white, read the letter, and threw it into the fire. She made no allusion to it afterwards, and I made none, for a promise is a promise. But she has never known an easy hour from that moment. There is always a look of fear upon her face, a look as if she were waiting and expecting. She would do better to trust me. She would find that I was her best friend. But until she speaks, I can say nothing. Mind you, she is a truthful woman, Mr. Holmes, and whatever trouble there may have been in her past life, it has been no fault of hers. I am only a simple Norfolk squire, but there is not a man in England who ranks his family honour more highly than I do. She knows it well, and she knew it well before she married me. She would never bring any stain upon it. Of that, I am sure. Well, now I come to the queer part of my story. About a week ago, it was the Tuesday of last week. I found on one of the window sills a number of absurd little dancing figures, like these upon the paper. They were scrawled with chalk. I thought that it was a stable boy who had drawn them, but the lad swore he knew nothing about it. Anyway, they had come there during the night. I had them washed out, and I only mentioned the matter to my wife afterwards. To my surprise, she took it very seriously, and begged me if any more came to let her see them. None did come for a week, and then yesterday morning I found this paper lying on the sundial in the garden. I showed it to Elsie, and down she dropped in a dead faint. Since then she has looked like a woman in a dream, half-dazed and with terror always lurking in her eyes. 
It was then that I wrote and sent the paper to you, Mr. Holmes. It was not a thing that I could take to the police, for they would have laughed at me. But you will tell me what to do. I am not a rich man, but if there is any danger threatening my little woman, I would spend my last copper to shield her. He was a fine creature, this man of the old English soil, simple, straight, and gentle, with his great earnest blue eyes and broad comely face. His love for his wife and his trust in her shone in his features. Holmes had listened to his story with the utmost attention, and now he sat for some time in silent thought. "'Don't you think, Mr. Cubitt, said he at last, "'that your best plan would be to make a direct appeal to your wife "'and to ask her to share her secret with you?' "'Hilton Cubitt shook his massive head. "'A promise is a promise, Mr. Holmes. "'If Elsie wished to tell me, she would. "'If not, it is not for me to force her confidence. "'But I am justified in taking my own line, and I will.' "'Then I will help you with all my heart.' In the first place, have you heard of any strangers being seen in your neighbourhood? No. I presume that it is a very quiet place. Any fresh face would cause comment. In the immediate neighbourhood, yes, but we have several small watering places not very far away, and the farmers take in lodgers. These hieroglyphics have evidently a meaning. If it is a purely arbitrary one, it may be impossible for us to solve it. If, on the other hand, it is semantic, I have no doubt that we shall get to the bottom of it. But this particular sample is so short that I can do nothing, and the facts which you have brought me are so indefinite that we have no basis for an investigation. I would suggest that you return to Norfolk, that you keep a keen lookout, and that you take an exact copy of any fresh dancing men which may appear. It is a thousand pities that we have not a reproduction of those which were done in the chalk upon the window sill. Make a discreet inquiry also as to any strangers in the neighbourhood. When you have collected some fresh evidence, come to me again. That is the best advice which I can give you, Mr. Hilton Cupid. If there are any pressing fresh developments, I shall be always ready to run down and see you in your Norfolk home. The interview left Sherlock Holmes very thoughtful, and several times in the next few days I saw him take his slip of paper from his notebook and look long and earnestly at the curious figures inscribed upon it. He made no allusion to the affair, however, until one afternoon, a fortnight or so later, I was going out when he called me back. "'You had better stay here, Watson.' "'Why?' "'Because I had a wire from Hilton Cubitt this morning. You remember Hilton Cubitt of the Dancing Men? He was to reach Liverpool Street at one twenty. He may be here at any moment. I gather from his wire that there have been some new incidents of importance. We had not long to wait, for our Norfolk squire came straight from the station as fast as a hansom could bring him. He was looking worried and depressed, with tired eyes and a lined forehead. "'It's getting on my nerves, this business, Mr. Holmes,' said he, as he sank like a wearied man into an armchair. It's bad enough to feel that you are surrounded by unseen, unknown folk who have some kind of design upon you. But when, in addition to that, you know that it is just killing your wife by inches, then it becomes as much as flesh and blood can endure. She's wearing away under it, just wearing away before my eyes. Has she said anything yet? No, Mr. Holmes, she's not. And yet there have been times when the poor girl has wanted to speak, and yet could not quite bring herself to take the plunge. I have tried to help her, but I dare say I did it clumsily, and scared her from it. She has spoken about my old family, and our reputation in the county, and our pride in our unsullied honour, and I always felt it was leading to the point, but somehow it turned off before we got there. But you have found out something for yourself? A good deal, Mr. Holmes. I have several fresh dancing men pictures for you to examine, and what is more important, I have seen the fellow. What? The man who draws them. Yes, I saw him at his work. But I will tell you everything in order. When I got back after my visit to you, the very first thing I saw next morning was a fresh crop of dancing men. They had been drawn in chalk upon the black wooden door of the tool house, which stands beside the lawn in full view of the front windows. I took an exact copy, and here it is. He unfolded a paper and laid it upon the table. Here is a copy of the hieroglyphics. At dash... Elrijes. Excellent, said Holmes. Excellent. Pray continue. 
When I had taken the copy, I rubbed out the marks, but two mornings later, a fresh inscription had appeared. I have a copy of it here. Come, dash, Elsie. Holmes rubbed his hands and chuckled with delight. Our material is rapidly accumulating, said he. Three days later, a message was left scrawled upon paper and placed under a pebble upon the sundial. Here it is. The characters are, as you see, exactly the same as the last one. After that, I determined to lie in wait, so I got out my revolver and sat up in my study, which overlooks the lawn and garden. About two in the morning, I was seated by the window, all being dark save for the moonlight outside, when I heard steps behind me, and there was my wife in her dressing gown. She implored me to come to bed. I told her frankly that I wished to see who it was who played such absurd tricks upon us. She answered that it was some senseless practical joke, and that I should not take any notice of it. If it really annoys you, Hilton, we might go and travel, you and I, and so avoid this nuisance. What? Be driven out of our own house by a practical joker, said I. Why, we should have the whole county laughing at us. Well, come to bed, said she, and we can discuss it in the morning. Suddenly, as she spoke, I saw her white face grow whiter yet in the moonlight, and her hand tightened upon my shoulder. Something was moving in the shadow of the tool-house. I saw a dark, creeping figure, which crawled round the corner and squatted in front of the door. Seizing my pistol, I was rushing out when my wife threw her arms round me and held me with convulsive strength. I tried to throw her off, but she clung to me most desperately. At last I got clear, but by the time I had opened the door and reached the house, the creature was gone. He had left a trace of his presence, however, for there on the door was the very same arrangement of dancing men which had already twice appeared, and which I have copied on that paper. There was no other sign of the fellow anywhere, though I ran all over the grounds. And yet the amazing thing is that he must have been there all the time, for when I examined the door again in the morning, he had scrawled some more of his pictures under the line which I had already seen. "'Have you that fresh drawing?' "'Yes, it is very short, but I made a copy of it, and here it is.' Again he produced the paper. The new dance was in this form. Never. "'Tell me said Holmes, and I could see by his eyes that he was much excited. Was this a mere addition to the first, or did it appear to be entirely separate? It was on a different panel of the door. Excellent. This is far the most important of all our purpose. It fills me with hopes. Now, Mr. Hilton Cubitt, please continue your most interesting statement. I have nothing more to say, Mr. Holmes, except that I was angry with my wife that night for having held me back when I might have caught the skulking rascal. She said that she feared I might have come to harm. For an instant, it had crossed my mind that, perhaps, what she really feared was that he might come to harm, for I could not doubt that she knew who this man was, and what he meant by these strange signals. But there is a tone in my wife's voice, Mr. Holmes, and a look in her eyes which forbid doubt— and I am sure that it was indeed my own safety that was in her mind. There's the whole case, and now I want your advice as to what I ought to do. My own inclination is to put half a dozen of my farm lads in the shrubbery, and when this fellow comes again, to give him such a hiding that he will leave us in peace for the future. I fear it is too deep a case for such simple remedies, said Holmes. How long can you stay in London? I must go back today. I would not leave my wife alone all night for anything— she is very nervous, and begged me to come back. I dare say you are right. But if you could have stopped, I might possibly have been able to return you within a day or two. Meanwhile, you will leave me these papers, and I think that it is very likely that I shall be able to pay you a visit shortly, and to throw some light upon your case. Sherlock Holmes preserved his calm professional manner until our visitor had left us, although it was easy for me, who knew him so well, to see that he was profoundly excited. The moment that Hilton Cubitt's broad back had disappeared through the door, my comrade rushed to the table, laid out all the slips of paper containing dancing men in front of him, and threw himself into an intricate and elaborate calculation. For two hours I watched him as he covered sheet after sheet of paper with figures and letters, so completely absorbed in his task that he had evidently forgotten my presence. Sometimes he was making progress, and whistled and sang at his work. Sometimes he was puzzled, and would sit for long spells with a furrowed brow and a vacant eye. Finally, he sprang from his chair with a cry of satisfaction, and walked up and down the room rubbing his hands together. Then he wrote a long telegram upon a cable form. 
If my answer to this is as I hope, you will have a very pretty case to add to your collection, Watson, said he. I expect that we shall be able to go down to Norfolk tomorrow, and to take our friend some very definite news as to the secret of his annoyance. I confess that I was filled with curiosity, but I was aware that Holmes liked to make his disclosures at his own time and in his own way, so I waited until it should suit him to take me into his confidence. But there was a delay in that answering telegram, and two days of impatience followed, during which Holmes pricked up his ears at every ring of the bell. On the evening of the second, there came a letter from Hilton Cubitt. All was quiet with him, save that a long inscription had appeared that morning upon the pedestal of the sundial. He enclosed a copy of it, which is here reproduced. Holmes bent over this grotesque frieze for some minutes, and then suddenly sprang to his feet with an exclamation of surprise and dismay. His face was haggard with anxiety. "'We have let this affair go far enough,' said he. "'Is there a train to North Warsham tonight?' I turned up the timetable. The last had just gone. "'Then we shall breakfast early and take the very first in the morning,' said Holmes. "'Our presence is most urgently needed. Ah, here is our expected cablegram. One moment, Mrs. Hudson, there may be an answer. No, that is quite as I expected. This message makes it even more essential that we should not lose an hour in letting Hilton Cubitt know how matters stand.' for it is a singular and dangerous web in which our simple Norfolk squire is entangled. So indeed it proved, and as I come to the dark conclusion of a story which had seemed to me to be only childish and bizarre, I experience once again the dismay and horror with which I was filled. Would that I had some brighter ending to communicate to my readers, but these are the chronicles of fact, and I must follow to their dark crisis the strange chain of events which for some days made Ridingthorpe Manor a household word through the length and breadth of England. Apologies, I guess I should have said the first half of the first chapter, leaving on a bit of a cliffhanger, as usual with these longer Sherlock stories. It's pretty fun to get into this. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Let me know. I'd love to hear from you if you are enjoying it. If you aren't enjoying it, whatever your opinion on the matter, I would love to hear from you. And, uh, yeah, just always looking for ways to improve and get better on this. Um, yeah, thanks, guys, for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next week.